give you some ideas about quantum thermodynamics to share with you things that they worked on. This is my team. I usually start with that because otherwise I won't forget. And uh, Eitan Geva was my first graduate student on the subject. Now he's a professor at Michigan. And these people, Jeff Gordon spent, I think, two years in Singapore working on classical thermodynamics. So maybe you don't know that he <laughs> was here. So he collaborated with me. Jose Palau was a postdoc, and Peter Solomon uh, is in uh, San Diego. We worked on uh, joint problems. Yair Rezek was a graduate student, and my current team is described here. Uh, this is my latest uh, graduate student, Roy Dan. Eric was a postdoc. Morag, graduate student. Amikam just finished now, is going to move to Berkeley. And Gil Katz and Tova Feldman are kind of long-time collaborators, which continue to work with me on, on these subjects. So, like any science, science is people and exchanging ideas. So this is how it starts. So this is kind of a menu of what I'm going to tell you. And the story will be about consistency. And the consistency that I'm going to talk about is the consistency between thermodynamics and quantum mechanics. So this is really kind of a joint story. We have two independent theories, and we can derive one from the other or the opposite way. So this is kind of a strong line of the research. And uh, no, move. move it out of the way. So I would say this question here is, has been answered experimentally here in Valerie's group, that thermodynamics can be scaled down to really a very single atom or single molecule or very small quantum device. So this has been answered. I'll talk about this a little bit, that usually when we think about thermodynamics, we think about steam engines, cars, big stuff. But thermodynamic can be scaled down to basically the most elementary quantum level. So this question, in a way, has been answered. And <coughs> so this, again, what's the limit of miniaturization of a quantum heat engine? And when we go through these topics, we see that these quantum devices really look like our cars. So then the question is, what is really thermodynamic and, quant and quantum thermodynamic? This is a new question, which has some nice answers. And the last question has partial answers. I would say this is an open research uh, question. Where can we find quantum supremacy? Where can a quantum engine work better than our car engine? So somebody, this is, I would say, if you find a, a new direction here, this is really top of the line in this field, which has become recently quite popular. So where do I start? I start or the field starts with this famous 1905 uh, paper by Einstein. So we have to think what Einstein uh, knew in 1905. And what he basically based this paper on is uh, classical statistical mechanics. And <coughs> the whole argument in this paper is about consistency <laughs> with thermodynamics. So in Einstein's view, thermodynamics is always correct, and a new theory should be consistent with thermodynamics. And the new theory that he invented or <coughs> conceived is, we could say, quantum mechanics. So you could say, in this case, quantum mechanics emerged out of thermodynamics. And you go through the paper. This is an English translation. And you see this equation and what Einstein writes. This equation shows that the entropy of a Monochromatic radiation of sufficiently low density varies with the volume according to the same law as the entropy of an ideal gas, that of dilute solution. So what does Einstein conclude for that? If the entropy of an ideal gas can be thought of as having a volume with particles inside, this means that light can be thought of the same way and light is quantized. So the idea of quantization comes from this equivalence in this equation of entropy. 
Now, if we go through this paper, here, this is the conclusion, monochromatic radiation of low density within the range of validity of Wine's radiation formula, it behaves thermodynamically as if it consists of mutually independent energy quanta of magnitude, okay, H bar is hidden here, R beta frequency divided by N. So, <coughs> you could say that this paper drives quantum mechanics out of thermodynamics, and what we usually, when we teach, we teach it in a wrong way, because we teach that Einstein was trying to explain an experiment. The, this paper in usual textbooks is referred to the photoelectric effect. Here's a photoelectric effect, 1914. This is the uh, experiment of Millikan, this linear line with the photoelectric effect, which at that time he determines Planck's constant out of that. So, the way of thinking is consistency and not trying to exp explain an experiment that didn't exist in 1905. So <clears throat> this is a kind of the lesson that we can learn from this early paper. And now what we do, we're, you could say more than 100 years later, we kind of tend to do the opposite. We try to derive quantum a thermodynamics out of quantum mechanics. You could see quantum mechanics is a well-established theory. And what we try to do in this field is trying to find quantum analogies to the laws of thermodynamics using this consistency argument and then try to learn something about our real world. So we have two independent theories. Each one has its own foundation and we should use both. So, <coughs> just uh, generally, what it allows us when we use quantum mechanics, we can get dynamics. When you talk about classical thermodynamics, we don't have a dynamical variable. We don't have time. Once we insert quantum mechanics, we have naturally time, and we can get equations of motion. So the theory is embedded in the theory of open quantum systems. There are many variants to this, but you could say the simple uh, variant that I'm going to use mostly is the Markovian master equation limit, which is a reduced description, which we associate to the name of Lindblad, which is <coughs> known. So this is, you could say, the uh, foundations or the basics. So let's go uh, <coughs> through some ideas. So. Here are the laws of thermodynamics, and we want to find analogies in quantum mechanics. And you could say the zeroth law is what we call isothermal partition. I have equilibration between what we are here in the room and the outside. It's not true. We have air conditioning here, but if we wouldn't have, we would be hot. So isothermal partition is establishes equilibrium and temperature. In quantum mechanics, it means tensor product between system and bath, which is a very strong assumption. But like many, this is an idealization, and this is idealization we use in quantum thermodynamics. Isothermal partition is, you could say, each system and bath are independent. They're tensor product, but still there's heat flow from the system to the bath. And this can happen in the weak coupling limit. This is correct. And then, if we look for the first law, we can take the time derivative of the first law and get these two equations. Uh, the change in energy is heat plus power. And this is the most simple version. I'll talk about it later. Not always you can use the simple version, but this is, I would say, ground zero. This is OK. <coughs> what you expect? that if I have radiation or some field imposed on the system, the direction of heat flow is always in this direction. This is the second law already of thermodynamics, that heat flows from power or work to, through the system unidirectionally to the bath. If we get an, a backflow like that, we did something wrong, which would be violation of the second law of thermodynamics. So this kind of keep this in mind as kind of general rules which we should always obey. So now, 
traditionally thermodynamics is worked by example. So you study an example, you learn from it, and you try to generalize. This is starting from Carnot, which is up here. And we have <coughs> the most simple quantum version of a Carnot engine, which is a three-level amplifier. So this work has been done by Scoville. This guy uh, was a picture down here. And Scoville was one of the inventors of solid state lasers. He worked in Bell Labs, he invented lasers, and he understood lasers, and he understood them in a thermodynamic context. So how does this work? Here's three levels, and in order to get amplification, I need population inversion between, let's say, this level and H and NC. So I need population inversion here. How do I going to get population inversion? I'm going to couple these two levels to a hot bath, these two levels to a cold bath, and then <coughs> what I want that the G, the gain, will be positive. So now we can calculate that. The <coughs> population here is the ratio between NC and N0. These two population is Boltzmann factor. The same thing we can say about the hot bath, it's Boltzmann factor. And now, if we want positive gain, we can stick these exponents into here. We can get rid of them because these are monotonic functions, and we can get out of that this inequality to get positive gain. Or the ratio of frequencies has to be smaller than the ratio of temperatures. Then we'll get population inversion between these two levels, and then we'll get positive gain, and we'll get an amplifier. <clears throat> now, if we want to ask what's the efficiency of this engine, I have to invent, invent a quant from the hot bath, which will have a frequency uh, omega h, as I wrote it here. What I get out is a radiation with frequency nu. So my ratio, so this is output, this is input. So this is the efficiency. If I write it like that, this frequency is a difference. I can write my efficiency like that. And what I get at the efficiency is 1 minus omega c minus omega h. This is called the auto cycle efficiency. It's the same efficiency as your car. And it's smaller than the Carnot efficiency. And when do we get Carnot efficiency? We get it in zero gain conditions. When exactly g is zero, then we get the three-level amplifier works exactly it has a Carnot efficiency, but zero power. Zero gain is zero power, and this is where we are. So this is really an important uh, paper. In a way, it was kind of forgotten for many years, and now people come back to this uh, uh, paper again. It, it's, it's static. You can see there's no time explicitly appearing here. And you can say it's a thermodynamic analysis of an engine, and we see the analogy between, you can say in this case, I would call it an auto engine and a three-level laser. So what's the next step? Let's invert it. I'll put radiation in, so I'll pump from here to here. I'll dissipate my heat into the hot bath. And I'll pump out of the heat out of the cold bath. So I'll close the cycle in this direction. So what do I get? I get a refrigerator. So again, you can find this in this paper of Scoville. This is, I would call, the first paper in laser cooling. This is, in a way, laser cooling. I take radiation. I use it to cool the cold bath. And <clears throat> all what I did, I just revert the same equations, just took the gain in a different direction. And you, again, you can get out of that what's the minimum temperature that you can cool, which is determined by these conditions. And you can get what's called the COP, the coefficient of performance. That tells us how efficient is my uh, refrigerator. In this case, you can say if the, I want to cool to microkelvin, it's not very efficient, but so what? The, University pays usually for the electric bill. We don't pay for that. So you can say the first paper in laser cooling is this. 
And not only that, they did the, even an experiment in microwave that was quite primitive in the way. And this paper, which people usually refer as the first papers in laser cooling by Wanland and uh, the other, same paper, 1975 in Hunch. These are papers that usually refer to as laser cooling. You can say they come much after this paper. There's another version, 1965. And you could say the, these journals are more obscure than Journal of Applied Physics. So it just tells you that people don't read out of their field. So, <clears throat> because you couldn't say that Scoville wasn't in the mainstream of physics. He was. But still, he did the theory. He did an experiment, not in, you can say, in the optical region as Wineland and Hench did. But still, he reached the right result. So you could say the first uh, idea about laser cooling comes from this paper. You can say both Wineland and Hench got the Nobel Prize, but not for this. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Much I'm not sure than 1959. It's not way before, but maybe. You have to look at that. I'm not sure. It's, it's about the same time. I agree. <laughs> okay, so now we, we have two examples, a refrigerator and an engine. I hope you got the point. There are two things of the same side. I can always take an engine, revert, reverse it, and go back. Okay, now comes the real theme of uh, thermodynamics. We have to put time. And really, the issue is uh, power or efficiency. This is a trade-off. As we saw before, zero power is, is reversible. And you can prove that any finite power uh, system is irreversible. So you have to pay for it. And then the question is, which car do you like better? this Lamborghini or this uh, most power efficient uh, version. <laughs> so uh, usually it's a vote. The younger people like to, to see this car, but for the, the days of my, my age, <laughs> like, <laughs> for all kinds of reasons, so you could make. Uh, so in an in a idea, you could say this is close to Carnot efficiency. And this car efficiency is close to a result. I wouldn't say it's universal, but at high temperature, it's almost universal. This, uh, what's called the Curzon Albon uh, efficiency, which is 1 minus the square root of Tc divided by Th. Now, this result was first found by Novikov, and I think again in the 50s, he analyzed the nuclear power plants. And in a power plant, it's a power plant. You, optimize power, not efficiency. And it would happen in Singapore and everywhere. So this result he got from an analysis of uh, nuclear power plants. And since then, it has been re-derived many times, like many good results. And <clears throat> now it's referred to as Curzon and Albo in a very nice paper of 1975, which did a very clear derivation. So that's how this result is usually called. So this is our dilemma. We we want to have power or efficiency, and this is when we analyze quantum devices, it's the same story. So I'll start for analyzing some continuous quantum engines. So this is a macroscopic jet engine, the one that brought me here, looks something like that. And here we have, again, this three-level laser that we get power out of. And so let's look at this uh, engine, at least analyzed. So I'm going to use uh, this version as a refrigerator. And I'm going to start with uh, Leo Zillard, and, uh, who invented an absorption refrigerator together with Einstein. So the story is that Zillard was kind of in the social community where Einstein was, because he was friends of friends. And he knew Einstein had did, maybe had lunch together, dinner together. <clears throat> and there was a problem that refrigerators that worked on ammonia exploded and people died from that. So in order to try to find an idea, 
they had an idea to have a refrigerator that doesn't work on ammonia, which was a coolant at the time, before we changed to Freon and made holes in the ozone. And so this is the refrigerator, kind of the design. It looks complicated. But in a way, the refrigerator works not on electric power. It uses heat to cool. So <clears throat> we can look at it. Uh, uh, depends on which direction we look at it. This is my power source. It's a hot, <clears throat> it's a hot uh, source of power. And you drive it in this direction. So you have heat flowing from hot to a cooler bath. So TH is colder than TW. So this would be the natural direction of flow. And while you do that, you pump heat out of the cold bath into the into this intermediate uh, hot bath. So you can see it's a, th it's a three, kind of a transistor, a three uh, a power device like that. And, <clears throat> and if you want to know where you have a system like that, if you go to the hospital here, that I know from my friend, Jeff Gordon, the air conditioning in the Singapore hospital is an absorption refrigerator. So there is a, gas source or whatever gives power, and that runs the air conditioning system. It's not connected to the electric grid. Why do you do that in the hospital? Because if you have a power shortage and you're in Singapore, you don't want the air conditioning to stop. So you have a fuel uh, to, to work for you. So this is an invention of, of Leo Zillard. And <clears throat> at that time, here you see Jeff Gordon who came from Singapore was working with me and with Jose Palau, and we kind of played with uh, our master equation. We found, wow, we found a, a quantum version of an absorption refrigerator. So how does it work? In a way, it's quite simple to, in a quantum version, is much easier to realize than what uh, you would think. I need three baths. You see a power source, hot bath, and a cold bath. I want to drive it in this direction and pull my heat out like that. So how do I do that? Second quantization is easy. I take a quant from here. So I destroy a quant here where I take it. I destroy a quant in the cold bath and I generate a quant of energy over here. So I have this nonlinear three body interaction here and the conjugate to make this Hermitian. Now, <clears throat> I can write it with a Hamiltonian, which looks like that. You can say I have three filters, <coughs> each one with a different frequency, omega h, omega c, and omega d. It's usually optimum to work in resonance conditions. You can see that the difference would be, uh, this would be the sum of h, omega h, and omega c, omega d. This is the usual condition that you want to work in. You don't have to. So you can see it's a very simple second quantization uh, Hamiltonian. The only point it's, it's nonlinear like that, which makes it a little bit more difficult to solve. I'll talk about it. So this is what you need to make a quantum absorption refrigerator. And energy balance and steady state, the sum of currents is zero. And if you look at entropy generation, since this is in steady state, you have only entropy generation in the baths. So you can write it immediately like that. This is the entropy generation, the hot bath, the cold bath, and over here, the sum has to be larger than zero. You have a quantum device in quantum terms, and you have thermodynamic uh, description of it. So now what we have to do is just solve for this equation, learn how this operates. So <clears throat> the first thing is, since it's nonlinear, I have to find some approximations to do that. So the easiest thing to do is a semi-classical approximation. I say that my power source is classical. So it's just time-dependent driving. So I replace it. So this immediately linearizes my equation, and I get linear equation of motion. So this would be a driven refrigerator. That I use the power to drive the refrigerator from here to here. You can say, what does it mean? There's no entropy in my power source, and I get this simpler uh, entropy balance. And <clears throat> if you look at the efficiency, 
It's the same efficiency I showed you before. This is the auto efficiency of uh, this refrigerator. Now, if you reverse it as an engine, this is, you could say, my, one of my first papers in the field, 1984. I reversed it, I made it an engine. And if you look at this engine, the efficiency at maximum power, it's the same relation as I showed you before. It gives you the Coors and Alburn relation. So this is the efficiency of maximum power of this device. <coughs> so this is as an engine. Let's, let's look at it again. Engine is a maximum power. What you see, the power becomes proportional to the quant of energy that I get out. The coupling to the electromagnetic field square, the pumping rate, which is gamma, and the gain. And this is almost universal. All these things work like that. And you can see kind of a Lorentzian term in the denominator. If you optimize it, you can see you optimize the pumping rate and the coupling to the, uh, to the field. You get this expression. The power is proportional to the quant of energy times the gain. And you get the coarsen alborn relation. Now, this graph here takes is uh, that I learned from Jeff Gordon. It's the efficiency divided to the Carnot efficiency and the power divided by the power maximum. You can have this as a universal kind of looking curve. There's this point here, which is, you could say, zero power, zero efficiency. So any engine has this point. The Carnot efficiency is an idealization that would sit up out here. So an engine. If you can't really drive it too slow because you have friction. You have to do things like that. So an engine always starts from this point, reaches a maximum efficiency point over here and a maximum power over here, and it has kind of this. So when you try to drive it too strongly, you get back here because then you start to basically cook your engine, dissipates too much, and you lose. So there's a maximum, always a maximum power and a maximum efficiency. And this kind of curve is universal and you find it almost everywhere. Let's go back to the refrigerator. What we decided to do to get over this nonlinearity, we decided to replace our power source by pure noise. So we simplified the Hamiltonian. We have this is a noise term and we can consider different types of noise, Poissonian or Gaussian and whatever. So it's a noise driven refrigerator. Now, first glance, this would be a little bit strange because what I said, a power source is zero entropy. It doesn't, but also pure noise is zero entropy. It's, usually you don't think about it like that, but pure noise is a zero entropy source. And these are the equations. Here's my <coughs> Hamiltonian. The noise, here's the noise. And if you do delta correlation noise or Gaussian noise, you can show that this equation is equivalent to a double commutator. I have my master equations that I can solve. In this case, it's completely solvable. And we solve it in Heisenberg equations of motion. And in this case, uh, oops, I'm going the other direction. This is pure noise. And you can show that infinite temperature of a source that has infinite temperature, which also is zero entropy, is mathematically equivalent to noise. It has, again, this double commutator structure. And there's another quantum version of this. If I do quantum measurement, if I do weak quantum measurement, I also get the same master equation. So I could have my engine driven by pure noise, high temperature, or quantum measurement, it would work, uh, from the point of view of a refrigerator, it would work the same. They're all zero entropy sources. Now when you solve it, this is a current coming from the cold bath. It has kind of a general structure. It has a quant of energy that I take out, a pumping rate, and the gain. Here I have some correction terms which uh, are determined by things like that, but you could say I could generalize my pumping rate. So this is kind of a universal uh, structure of this uh, refrigerant. 
Now the COP, which is the coefficient of performance, the ratio of cold current to hot current, is again the auto, which is limited by Carnot. So this is again no surprise from a thermodynamic point of view. Now I, we analyze other refrigerators, and what I want to tell you that there is kind of a universal character. That if I look at the cold bath current, it has this quantum of energy, a kinetic term, and a gain. And this is a three-level absorption refrigerator. This is a power-driven refrigerator, Gaussian noise, Poissonian noise. They all have this kind of general structure. So you could say at a certain, at the quantum level, all these refrigerators look the same. And now we can employ them and ask the question, how difficult it is to cool to the absolute zero. If that's what we really want to do, we want to make cold ion traps or something like that. We want to know how difficult it is, how does a cooling rate scale with temperature. So first of all, we want to optimize the cooling rate when the temperature goes to zero. And since we have a universal kind of structure, we can look at this expression and we can say, this is going to win. It doesn't matter if this scales somehow, this should scale with omega c with the frequency, but this Boltzmann factor is going to be dominant in the optimization, which means that the cold bath frequency, my filter on the cold bath should scale with temperature. So this is the first result, which is true here, just, just shows you how this looks. And then if we, do, we did this optimization, we can ask how does the rate of cooling go to zero when the cold bath temperature goes to zero? And that is, depends on the bath. So this is not universal. You could say you could have a phonon bath, solid state, a Bose gas, a Fermi gas. So if I look at the scaling of the cold bath temperature, a uh, cold bath current with a temperature, we can see different scalings. You can see the Bose gas, the uh, Fermi gas, and which goes like that. And <clears throat> if we look at the rate of cooling, how does this scale with temperature? This exponent has to be larger than one, otherwise we violate the second law. And we find out that it's very close to one for, uh, for phonons. It's linear, as you see here. And for both Fermi gas and Bose gas, we get this ratio t to the power of 3 halves. So I wouldn't say this is universal, but still it has a correct behavior from the point of view of the third law of thermodynamics. The cooling rate vanishes when the temperature goes to zero, and we have an extra thing. We have the exponents. How fast does it vanish when we cool? So in a way, this is not so bad, this linear relation. At least this is limited by that. And you could say that what does it mean if you think if I want to cool a gas to... Uh, from getting a mot to getting a BC, which is a th factor of a thousand, it means I have to work a thousand harder. So it means I lose a thousand factor in particles. I do something, it's more difficult. <coughs> okay, this is just to, to summarize. This is uh, Walter Nernst, which <coughs> formulated the third law of thermodynamics. And as I said, the cooling rate scales as this quant, the coupling, and the gain. And we, here, this is, there are two versions of the third law of thermodynamics. This has to va vanish, we have one exponent, or the entropy has to vanish, we have another exponent, and they're related, and we can figure this out. Here's a realization. As I told you, the absorption refrigerator, uh, who's, who's responsible? <laughs> this is a realization. So that made me very happy because at least, okay, I'm a theorist, so I can do whatever I want. Nobody believes me anyway. But, <laughs> but once it's realized in the lab, so I didn't put the slide for this talk. I, I put it here. And uh, this is a realization of, as I said, this tricycle structure that we use work bath. Oh, they drew it not in the right direction. You see, I had it in a different, uh, <laughs> rotated by 90 degrees. 
So I'm very happy to be here that this uh, experiment has been uh, realized. Okay, so now let's go to a different type of engine. This is auto engine, our car engine named. So here is a macroscopic version and here's <coughs> Uh, quantum version, and I wrote it as a quantum circuit. And you'll see in a, in a minute that I, you can th consider these reciprocating engines as quantum circuits. So let's uh, see it. Here's Otto. So this is the inventor of our car engine. This is his handwriting. You see 1876. And what's again interesting, it was first he did the theory and then he built the engine. And he figured out the efficiency, and here's a picture of the first uh, version of the auto engine. Let's, let's, this is difficult. Nobody opens the car hood. Who's the last time who opened? I think I opened my car hood maybe five years ago. <laughs> Nobody does it anymore. So let's see how an auto engine works like. This is an auto cycle. I have a cylinder full of gas. I heat it up. Then I expand my cylinder when the gas is hot. I get work out of it. Then I pour cold water on my cylinder. I cool it down and I compress it when it's cold and I close the cycle. So why do I get net work out of it or power? Because I get more work when I expand it when it's hot when I, than when I compress it when it's cold. That's how our car engine works like. So once we have this idea, we can realize it in any quantum device. This is a realization which I did in a harmonic oscillator. So how does it work? We can start from here. I, I'm in contact with a hot bath. I put some population in these levels. Then I expand my gas. So uh, what does it mean? I take high frequency to lower frequency. The population stays <coughs> constant. So this is a diabetic move, also quantum adiabatic move. And the work I get is a change in frequency times the population. This is what I get here. Then I cool it down. So you say move population from here, I got it colder. And then I compress. I go from low frequency to high frequency. Again, with constant population. I get change times omega c. And if you know how much work I got it, it's a change in frequency times the change in population. This would be the uh, work that I got out of uh, my ideal, you could say, quantum uh, auto engine. If I look at my Hamiltonian, it has kinetic energy, a spring constant, which is time dependence times potential energy. So this is my Hamiltonian. And you should notice my Hamiltonian is time dependent. And this description here is adiabatic. I can make a refrigerator. I just reverse it. No big deal. The same thing. And now let's look at it in phase space. Phase space is more interesting because I can think now in a way quantum mechanically. So let's say I started here. Here I'm in thermal equilibrium in phase space. So I have a Gaussian both in position and in momentum, and this is, you can <coughs> say, my energy shell, which looks like a bowl. So this is position, this is momentum, so this is what they do. Now, I move to this direction. I change the frequency, so I made this fatter in this direction. This direction stayed the same. So what happened? I got squeezy. If I do it too fast, I got quantum squeezing. So I generated coherence. Now, if I cooled it, I got rid of my coherence. Again, this is an equilibrium with a cold bath. And then if I move here too fast, I got squeezing again. So if you think about this description, generating coherence is going to cost me power. So this engine is not the most efficient but it has more power because I'm using... Uh, so now let's think how to describe such an engine. As I said, I can think about it as a product of four propagators, equilibration, 
uh, adiabatic equilibration was a cold bath, adiabatic equilibration was a hot bath. So I can think about this as four propagators. These are my quantum circuits or not. And what's important, they don't commute. They, if, if my engine would commute, even my car engine, it couldn't work. So you could say, okay, is my car engine quantum? This is another question. The answer is no. My car engine is not quantum. So we'll see when we reach the quantum limit. And what we're interested in is in a limit cycle. That's also in the car. We want the engine to reach stationary solutions. So my solution, the vector that describes my engine, should be invariant to the cycle. This is where I start my engine. It reaches steady state. This is where I want to be. OK, so now, why is my car engine not quantum? I can describe it by only population, a master equation that describes only population and energy levels. And you could show that the master equation, the thermalization and the adiabatic moves, which are uh, permutations, don't commute. So I don't need, in this sense, quantum mechanics to get non-commuting operators. Although classical mechanics, everything commutes. OK, so now. <clears throat> How do we solve this? I define three variables, my Hamiltonian, my Lagrangian, three quantum time-dependent operators, and the coherence, which is a position-momentum correlation. You can see these two things describe my squeezing. And you can show that my state of my engine can always be described by maximum entropy state or if you write it like that, it looks like a squeezed thermal state, if I write it in this way. So my engine can always be described with three variables. Now, what's the difference here? In classical, uh, not in statistical mechanics, there's one variable, the energy. This, if I know the energy, I know everything. I get the partition function. In this case, since I'm out of equilibrium, I need more variables. But I don't need infinitely many variables. I need only three variables that I can completely describe my cycle. So in a way, I'm recovering statistical mechanics through a generalized maximum entropy state, which looks like that. So this, again, is the miracles of harmonic oscillators, which things can be done analytically. And you can write equations of motion, Heisenberg equations motion for these variables. So these are the equations of motion that we need, the Hamiltonian part and thermalization. These three sets of operators are closed. This is the thermalization state. And we can get directly from this Q, as I wrote before, it's the expectation value of the Louisville operator, the dissipator of the Hamiltonian. And we, we can get this propagator that I told you that describes the thermalization. So everything is completely closed. And what's, what you can see that the energy, which is the first variable, is decoupled from the coherence, which is correct for almost all Lindblad cases where this is a, pr uh, a property of, uh, you could say, of the weak coupling limit. Now, the adiabatic is, is more difficult because I have a Hamiltonian that's time dependent. The power looks like that. But I can define a diabetic parameter, which is dimensionless, which is omega dot divided by omega square. This is dimensionless. This de defines how fast I'm going to do my stroke. So when mu is zero, that's infinitely slow. That's the daisy car. But I want this to be as big as possible. I get an equation of motion which looks like that. What's nice about it, if you look at it, although all the time dependence appears here in this omega of t, and this part of the matrix is time independent, so I can solve this in closed form. So this is the propagator in closed form under constant mu. So I get the solution here, which is not uh, too difficult. But I can get directly out of this the power you can say there are two components of power. I have the Hamiltonian part, which is useful work, and I have the coherence. And this is general. In order to generate coherence from a thermal ensemble, I have to 
uh, I need work. So coherence costs me work, but this is also the opposite is true. If I have coherence, I can extract work out of it even if I have a single bet. This is also uh, correct. So you can see this here. Here's how the cycle looks in these variables. The HLC has a nice trajectory in this vector space here. This is thermalization of the hot bath. This is thermalization of the cold bath. And here are these adiabatic moons that are here. Now, the efficiency is auto-efficiency, as I said before, smaller than Carnot. And the high temperature limit leads to the same result that I showed you before if we look at it as an engine. Uh, now, this is not a complete uh, abstract. This, you could say, is a realization in outer space. This I took from NASA. This is a refrigerator based on the cycle, and the auto cycle. So it's called a diabetic demagnetization refrigerator. I think if helium would run out of the world fast enough, this would be even common in labs. I saw this in labs in uh, Schmidt-Meyer's lab in Vienna. I saw a refrigerator that's... <coughs> Uh, based on this principle. So what you have is a magnetic pellet which moves up and down from the hot side to the cold side. You have, as I said, a heat switch here. And you change the frequency by changing the magnetic field. So it has the same uh, auto cycle. So this is, you can say, a macroscopic version. And this is a mi microscopic uh, version which has been realized quite recently. So this is in the lab of Ferdinand schmidt kaller and Kilian, where is Kilian Singer? So these two people are responsible for that. It was head of the group and the head of the lab. These are the people associated. And this auto engine is a single ion in a trap. So it's a discrete engine. You can see it here. It, the ion, you can see the electrodes of the ion are like that. So the ion goes like that, back and forth in this case. And here these are cooling lasers and, and so on. So this is, you could say, here you can look at the, this is expansion, here is compressed, here it's cooled, uh, they're working in this direction. So it's not in the same direction that I saw, so they're like that here, going from high frequency to low frequency, cooling, so this is their auto cycle. So, I hoped I convinced you, and I didn't have to convince you, there are all uh, ex sufficient experiments to show that the thermodynamic engine can work at a single uh, ion in a trap. And if you have three ions in a trap, it's an absorption refrigerator. So we're already in the uh, microscopic world. So now <clears throat> I showed you two types of, of you can say, generalized uh, devices, discrete and continuous. And you could ask, is there a connection? Can I go from, you can say, a jet engine here, a car engine, or a motorcycle engine? Is there some limit, a quantum limit, when all become the same? And I hope to convince you that there is a limit like that. It's a limit of small action. And here is just to realize that in a certain way. This is a four-stroke engine made out of only one qubit. So here it's hot, I compress, I go, so I get work here and work here. This is hot bath, cold bath, hot bath again. So it's periodic in this direction. So this is a four stroke engine. A two stroke engine in the quantum version is, you can think about it like that. I take my, let's say a qubit, equilibrate it with a hot bath. I take another qubit, equilibrate it with a cold bath, and then I do a swap between them. So Franco Nori uh, suggested that, I don't know, 15 years back. And so this is a two-stroke. I have thermalization, work equilibration. And a continuous engine here, we have a three-level laser, which would be a minimum model in this case. So. In order to show the equivalence, we use the same four-level system for the all devices, so we can have some common Hamiltonian to all of them. So this would be a four-stroke engine. You can say first equilibrate this. I do swap here, then equilibrate this, 
then a swap again. This would be a four stroke, which would look like that. A two stroke, I equilibrate this and this simultaneously and then do a swap like that. So you can say, here I have equilibration, this is work, the black one. Or a continuous engine, everything is happening uh, simultaneously. Now you can write the propagator of the cycle. I have a propagator. I wrote it this curly u. I can always write it e to the power of some Louisvillian times t. This is equivalent. Now, as a four-stroke engine, I showed you that we can write it as a product of propagators. So I can write it like that. And then, in the limit of small action, where each propagator <coughs> does very little. You can see each propagator, what it does, it does some rotation and contraction in phase space, because it does both thermalization and rotation in some generalized uh, Hilbert space. So if my, this angle is small, this means this action is small relative to h bar. Then I can take this product and write it, in, first of all, in a symmetric way. I can take half of this, put it here, since it's cyclic. And then I can take the product and make it into a sum, which is standard procedure, Trotter formula, or something like that. And this would be correct up to the, uh, you could say, the action to third power. So in this limit, you can say, I took a discrete version and made it a, to, into a continuous version. So in the limit of small action, all engines are quantum equivalent. And you can test that in this model. We have tested it in other models. That you can say, here, this is the time that at the end of each stroke, all engines become equivalent. For large action, they're not. And this equivalence is correct for work, for heat, and for dissipation. Everything is the equivalent is, uh, in a way for all orders in this case. And <coughs> which I said for large, I, here, this is, a, you could say, the power as a function of the action. So this is a continuous engine, the four stroke one version, another version, two stroke, but when we look at the small action, which is here enlarged here, all of the power here you see converges to the same value up to S squared, the action squared. So this uh, idea of equivalence uh, works, but that tells us something else. Oop. That uh, now I want to give me an engine behind the wall. And you ask me, is this a quantum engine or not? Now, how, first of all, how do we know that this is quantum? This limit of small action. There's a simple way to do that. I'll add dissipation. If I'll add dissipation and kill the coherence, the engine won't work. So that's, you could say, if I know the engine works by coherence, I can kill the coherence, the engine won't work. So, Adding dissipation or doing too much thermalization would kill the engine. So engine works by coherence. So now the second question is, you give me an engine behind the wall and I have only access to what I can measure, the power. So how do I know that this engine is quantum? So this is what we found. There's a quantum signature. You can say that since if I find an engine, this is cycle time, that works in this region, here I put here this region, this is this kind of dividing border, I know it has to be quantum. So I can put, a, you can say, a boundary between the quantum world and the classical world. I can say an engine, a, a cyclic engine which works at long cycle time like our car doesn't have to be quantum, but if it it's still delivers power at short enough cycle, it has to be quantum. It means it has to maintain its coherence uh, throughout the, the cycle. So we have, you can say, we have a, a way to a, an idea which can be measured to see if an engine is quantum or not. So this hasn't been realized 
experimentally yet. There are experiments done at Walmsley Lab in Oxford. I hope there'll be results. There are preliminary results that show that we are right, but this is not enough to nail down the paper. Experimentalists know that. You have to do this again and again. I will see Walmsley in a week and a half. I hope he has, he's happy enough with the results to make it publishable. Okay, so the last thing I want to, how much time do I have? More or less finish, okay. So I, I'll finish in, in a few minutes, I'll sum up. The last thing I want to show that we can go to strong coupling. One idea is to add heat exchangers. In a way, a heat exchanger is a way to bridge the weak coupling limit to the strong coupling limit. And this goes back to a single molecule act as a refrigerator. The answer is yes. This is a model that we solved numerically to do strong coupling. You can see it's a double well coupled to a hot and cold bath. The baths are spin baths. And we wanted to see if we can work this as a refrigerator. And strong coupling, you have to be a little bit more careful in your definition. What is meaningful is always currents. You can't talk about heat and, and, uh, and work. You can talk about energy current, which you can calculate quantum mechanically. And in steady state, you should get, an, if you don't not driving it, you should get flow from hot to cold, from this direction to this direction. I'll skip this, how we do this calculation. I'll just come here to where you could say Jeff Gordon uh, led me to do this graphs. This is a molecular refrigerator. This is to look at performance. So this is a heat current as a function of, of pumping rate. And you can see first I have a heat leak, which means heat goes from hot to cold. So it doesn't work. There's a minimum driving. This is strong coupling that I have to get. I get maximum cooling rate. And then when I try to pump too strongly, my cooling vanishes. This is, you could say, universal. Strong coupling, you go up and go down. This is always true. Now, if you look at the graph, the current as a function of the COP, I think I had it the other way around. You can see first, I get no current. This is what we saw here before. There is a minimum pumping rate that I start to go. I go to maximum current, and this point here is maximum efficiency. So I go through this loop and go back down here. And this is the same if I try to drive this too strongly. This I don't understand here. First I go down, and then I go up. This is the maximum. Uh, cooling current, and then I go down. So driving, again, I think this is related to dissipation or uh, dephasing, this kind of behavior here. This is strong coupling. This is a graph from this work of this book that was written here, Gordon and, and ne how would you pronounce it, Neg? And uh, which the only thing is that this is uh, opposite. This COP is here and my COP is here. And with that, I'm going to uh, stop here and just summarize what I said, that we saw emergence of thermodynamics from quantum mechanics. I hope I showed you that. And we already have realizations of this limit. and. I hope I answered you what is quantum in a quantum heat engine. At least partially I answered this question. And this question. And the last question I didn't deal upon. There are some, uh, I would say, preliminary results that show that you can get quantum supremacy in, in heat engines, which would be, I would say, the next topic. Maybe next time I'll come here, I'll talk about <laughs> it. And thank you.
it's, it, it's universal high temperature limit. It's not universal. At low temperatures, you can get other things. Now, you can beat it. Okay, in general, you can beat the Carnot if you use a squeezed bath. But you could say, am I cheating? The answer is not. Because a squeezed bath has two properties. It has, it's hotter, but it also has coherence. So if I can cache on coherence, I can use this either for increasing my efficiency or to increase my power. So you can say that's one answer. A squeeze bath can work. Uh, I don't know. If in the high temperature limit, let's say without a squeeze bath, can you, can you beat this limit? Uh, I don't know. Okay, that's, I can say, I can give a whole talk about that. <laughs> and and so, so you can say, w w w let's do this exercise. Let's say we accept the laws of, of uh, uh, quantum mechanics and we want to derive a thermodynamic picture out of that. So w what can we do in a trivial way and what do we need to do, let's say, use ergodic properties and so on. So you, you could say that the partition between system and bath, and if we, we agree that the evolution of the whole universe is unitary or driven, you could call it the church of the Hamiltonian. This is a word that I stole from Charlie Bennett. If we believe in that, then you could say the second law is almost trivial. Because what do you say? A unitary transformation doesn't change the entropy of the whole world. And, but if I do a partition and all what's available to me is local entropy, for sure it will grow. This is almost trivial. So, so this aspect of the second law is, is, you could say, part of it. Now let's look at the, equi par the isothermal partition, which is more related to the zeroth law. So you could say, what do we need there in order to derive this? It's an idealization. So the weak coupling limit is exactly this idealization. The weak coupling between system and bath, if we take it to second order, and so we, we automatically generate the KMS condition, the Kubo-Martin-Schwinger condition of, of equilibrium out of the second order. So you can say if I'm close to equilibrium, this is okay. Now, more than that, the weak coupling limit <coughs> If you go all the way to the Markovian limit, Markovian limit means tensor product between system and bath all the time. So it means that my properties of the system are local and the properties of the bath are local and I, I'm in, in good shape to continue from that. So you can say these, these two pillars are, I would say, by today established. So what, what is, where, where, where do we go from, from here? What, what is more interesting? or more, you could say, under study, is this issue of thermalization, which we need ergodic properties. And that's more related to strong coupling. If I have a system touching some large bath and we know it equilibrates, what are the conditions to get uh, thermalization? So <clears throat> I would say this is, is still under study. There are interesting results in this direction of thermalization, which are related to what's called the eigenvalue thermalization hypothesis or ergodic properties of quantum systems. And typically ergodic properties of quantum systems are much stronger than classical ergodic properties. So if we have a partition, I would say the common notion that works well, that we get equilibration at least this is, I would say, I wouldn't say there is a proof here. So I hope I gave you kind of a sketch. One more question. 
question? Yes. Perhaps you could say a little bit more about the test you use to check whether the engine is functioning or not. In the sense that this engine needs correlations. <coughs> How do you know the correlations come from a functional nature and not from a test? Yeah. <coughs> okay, so the way the way to analyze it an engine it what it produces is power energy so you can say a classical energy if i know a classical engine if i know the population and the energy levels i know everything so i can extract if i if you give me the dynamics i can extract from that the power the thermalization so all what you need in a way is one variable or one distribution to, to calculate the engine. Now, if I have coherence, it doesn't commute with the energy. So I already have this dilemma. I have two, at least two variables that don't commute. So this means, you could say that a very simple notion would be, if I look at the engine while it works, it won't work. This is the same in quantum computing. So why do, if I look at the engine and measure its energy, I, di I kill the coherence. So I add, uh, you could say I add dissipation, this double commuting. My engine won't work. So my engine, my quantum engine works in the other room and in the dark, I don't look at it. I only extract the power. So you can say my, my way to verify that, if I look at it, it stops to work. I hope this is a good explanation. 